Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Amanda Goyette. I'm an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be moderating today's webinar with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development at AERA. And uh, looking forward to today's webinar. Charles is a Porsche expert, and uh, this is a topic that we see in our tech line a fair bit about how to address these you know, these cylinders and, and this type of material. Another feature, uh, and we've been asked this on our tech line here that recently, just how can you find a shop closest to where I'm located? So I thought we'd bring up a slide today that we call our member locator. And this is on our website. And if you just go to our website and go under membership, you'll find the member locator. There's the web address right there. This is really handy because what you can do is maybe you're looking for an AERA member or an AERA supplier. You just need to type in the city or the address or you know where you're located and it will find all of the shops or schools or suppliers close to where you are. So great little tool called the member locator and uh, then that's there for you to use as well. All right, well enough out of me. Um, let's bring on Charles. Now Charles Navarro from Ellen Engineering like I mentioned before, they're a specialty in the niche market of, of Porsche and extensive background in aluminum cylinder bores. So if you've got any questions for Charles, make sure to put them in that questions box and we'll get them answered at the end here for you. So Charles, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Y you betcha. No, looking forward to it. Um, your sound is good. We can see your full screen. So like I say, if anybody's got any questions, put them in the questions box and we'll get those over to Charles. Okay. Well, thank you for everyone uh, that took time out of your busy day to join us. Um, my name's Charles Navarro. I'm the uh, co-founder and president of Ellen Engineering. Um, as you probably or maybe not know, that uh, we specialize in uh, solutions for Porsche uh, ap applications and we service the aftermarket. Um, we're best known for our uh, air-cooled cylinders we manufacture and also all the work we do with the uh, reconditioning of aluminum uh, engine blocks. Um, and also we're pretty well known for our intermediate shaft bearing fixes uh, to address uh, a well-known problem with uh, Boxster, Cayman, and 911 models uh, of a certain generation. Uh, but with that said, I'll just dive right into this. I have a lot of stuff I wanted to go over, and like, it, like we'll do questions at the end, and uh, I'd be more than happy to answer everyone's questions at that point. So I'm going to start way back at the beginning. So the Chevy Vega and Reynolds A390. So basically, Reynolds A390 is what Alucil is today. So if you're not aware of what this technology is, basically uh, you can use the material to cast a block and there's silicon particles in the aluminum and through a special process, you expose those silicon particles um, and then uh, it also requires uh, special coating on the pistons and basically what they did was an ironclad coating. Um, so the wear surface, uh, you basically have a raw aluminum bore and then you have an ironclad uh, piston. So this technology, um, obviously in the years after the, the Vega, uh, Porsche was one of the first companies to uh, use this technology. Uh, the 944, uh, they switched from a cast iron block to an all aluminum engine. Um, that provided a significant increase in displacement. Um, it also uh, helped with cooling keeping the engine uh, reliable and running cool. Um, and But the biggest thing was it allowed them to increase the displacement without making the engine any physically bigger as far as footprint and also a substantial weight reduction, which helped with handling. So in Porsche's uh, own uh, development work, which you can download the publication, it's in the uh, um, Society of Automotive Engineers uh, database. Uh, they document uh, all the development work that was in there. Um, they did wear testing, and it does wear faster than uh, cast iron, um, but they found that the wear rate was acceptable. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, going to an all aluminum engine block allowed them to uh, have the engine run cooler, make more power, reduce emissions, and also improve fuel economy which is all great things uh, for a performance vehicle. So 
Porsche wasn't the only one on GM, of course, uh, but in later years, the Japanese also uh, uh, developed a similar technology. Um, Honda, the Prelude, was the first one to use it, um, and they used, in their hyper eutectic uh, castings, they use uh, carbon fiber and alumina for reinforcement. Uh, Porsche used um, in the Boxster Cayman 911, which used a Locasil engine block, which I'll discuss a little bit later, um, which is, uh, I, I dumb it down and call it localized Alucil. Um, but they used uh, alumina, uh, like Honda did, for uh, reinforcement of the cylinder walls. Uh, this technology was then later used in the NSX and S2000 models successfully. And uh, it's more scoring, uh, since that's the main topic of the discussion today with aluminum blocks, I, you really don't see issues with uh, Honda's implementation of this technology. Uh, likewise, Toyota uh, did a similar thing. Um, if you, they had two engines, one had a cast iron block, the other one had aluminum block, uh, no increase in displacement, but going to an all aluminum block provided 26% horsepower increase, 5% more torque, uh, and obviously the weight reduction. Um, and their process, uh, they used uh, silica uh, fibers and molite, like the Locasil process that was developed by Colvin Schmidt, and they did an iron phosphate plating on the piston. So again, same general idea, different technology, but still an all aluminum hyper eutectic engine block. So looking at some of the data out there, um, obviously the trend, um, we're being pushed uh, towards, uh, want, everyone wants us to go electric. Uh, Ideally, uh, the intermediate would be more hybrid technology, but we're seeing a lot more uh, turbocharged three-cylinder engines, a lot more turbocharged four-cylinder engines, and same with six cylinders um, in place of, in, instead of a normally aspirated V6 or normally aspirated V8. Um, this is also, and also use of aluminum engine blocks, again, help reduce the weight, the footprint of the engine, um, while increasing fuel economy and output. Uh, so aluminum engine blocks are here to stay uh, as long as uh, we can keep the internal combustion engine uh, alive and on the road. And like I, on the right, you can see the trend uh, in the last uh, 10 years is a significantly de significant decrease in average engine displacement. Again, that pushing towards ground downsizing um, and the aluminum engine block is a key uh, in that. Uh, a great example of that is the Mercedes M139 engine. Um, they're making 421 horsepower out of a two liter all aluminum engine. Um, and obviously that they're doing that reliably in a production car um, that requires an all aluminum engine for uh, thermal and volumetric efficiency to get that kind of output and have it be reliable. So here's an example, um, and this is from uh, Colvin Schmidt. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, what's allowed. So if you get rid of the iron sleeve in an aluminum block, uh, that allows for a much larger bore size in that same footprint. Um, the next big difference with an all aluminum engine is when you get rid of that uh, iron sleeve uh, in an aluminum block that you can reduce the size of the water jackets. Um, there's less coolant and also the heat transfer is much better. That's why you don't need as much coolant or as large of a cooling system uh, for those engines. And here's a, another example of an Alucil engine. Uh, Porsche, this is a, a Audi V8, but Porsche has a very similar engine that's used in the Cayenne Panamera. Um, and they also have them in six cylinder and eight cylinder versions, all cast out of Alucil. Um, it's a monolithic casting, so it's, the whole block is made out of alucil. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, those silicon particles. So if you zoom in with a microscope uh, close enough, you can see those raised silicon particles in there. Um, and what happens, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the, the oil film forms around those silicon particles, and that's what supports the piston and the rings going on that cylinder bore, because if you didn't have those silicon particles, there's no way that aluminum would hold up. 
so now referring to Locacil, like I mentioned earlier, I call it localized allucil. So the, the engine block can be cast out of plain old aluminum. And what uh, Porsche did using the Kolben-Schmidt Locacil process is they use a freeze cast liner that has silicon particles embedded in a, a resin matrix. And when they push that molten aluminum in, it burns off the resin and leaves the silicon particles behind. Uh, so basically you have those silicon particles only in the area around the cylinder bores. Uh, that's why I call it localized allucil. So the hypereutectic alloy is only in the cylinder bore area. So one of the issues with Locasil, um, and Porsche was the only manufacturer ever to use this technology, uh, and the Boxster came in 911 from 97 through 2008, is that you can actually see the two different alloys. You can see the high silicon content, which is the thinner portion that you can see on the, on the right, and then you have the parent metal, which is just plain old aluminum behind it supporting it. Um, and what we have seen in some instances is that there's actually a separation of those two materials um, and, and also the fact that you have dissimilar alloys, even though they're, they're both aluminum, they're different enough that we see uh, the cylinders crack um, and uh, some of these blocks as well, uh, they had manufacturing issues and they actually sleeved them from the factory with a metal matrix composite sleeve and those sleeves also can drop and cause failures. So going to the preparation, because that's the key thing with uh, hyperutectic engine block. So you have um, the boring operation, then you have the honing operation, and then the last step is the, silicon, uh, is the exposure of those silicon particles. So there's different ways this process can be carried out. Uh, Back when uh, GM used Alucil and then Porsche back in the, in the uh, 70s and 80s and going into the 90s, they used an etching process where uh, you use a paste and you lap, basically lap the bores and that strips the aluminum from the surface and leaves the silicon particles behind. That process um, is a, a, the most gentle process and it doesn't, damage those silicon particles. Um, in later years, like current production uh, vehicles, they're using a mechanical exposure method where they go in with a specially designed tool that uh, removes the aluminum and leaves those silicon particles behind. Um, talking about the issue with scoring with the cylinders, um, historically, we don't see cylinder failures with scoring on the air-cooled 2.7, three liter 911 engines, or the water-cooled Porsche 944, uh, 968 engines. Um, I don't know if that's because of the um, process. We're assuming it's one of the contributing factors is the actual exposure process. These, they were using the, the, uh, the pace that etches the aluminum away versus the current mechanical process. Uh, the other thing which I'll touch on is that they've changed the way they coat the piston. So talking about the, the piston coating, so uh, typically in a hyperutectic engine, the engines run very, very tight piston to cylinder clearances. Um, with a cast piston, we've seen applications where they're running as little as three tenths of a thousandth total clearance. Um, and then with a forged piston, uh, one thou uh, current Porsche engines with a forged uh, piston with a uh, IUCL block. Uh, we've disassembled a brand new engine so we can measure that. They were setting the clearance right at seven tenths to eight tenths of a thousand total clearance with a uh, forged piston. Uh, so with an all aluminum block, you can run much tighter clearances uh, that uh, supports the piston better. You have better ring support, less oil consumption, etc. Um, as far as the pistons, um, at least in the Porsche applications, there's two suppliers. You have Mala that does the forge pistons, um, and then Kolben Schmidt does the cast pistons. Uh, with the cast pistons from Kolben Schmidt, they use a plating on the piston, 
and uh, the Mala Forge pistons and the newer engines with Alucil have a, a, a coated skirt that's applied kind of like a Teflon coating, but instead of Teflon, it's uh, some sort of iron or some composite coating that can, hand, can hold up against that raw aluminum bore with those silicon particles because a traditional coating like you would send to uh, Calico to have a piston uh, skirt coating, that type, that type of coating will not hold up on a hyper-eutectic engine bore. So here's a close-up so you can see um, what that coating looks like. So this particular uh, picture that you see, this is a uh, forged piston from Mala, and you can see the uh, ferro print, uh, what they call it. So it's a composite. So it's a polyamide and it has uh, steel particles embedded in it. Um, and that provides that dissimilar alloy that's required uh, to allow that piston to survive an aluminum bore. Because if you had that piston without a coating on it like this, um, it would basically gall and uh, this, both the piston and the bore would eat each other alive. So uh, specifically with uh, the Locasil engine block that are used again from 97 through, uh, through 08 and the Porsche Boxster came in 911, um, they have a high propensity uh, to have failures. And the biggest one that we see is cylinder bore scoring. Uh, this was from an article from uh, the Porsche Club of America uh, several years back documenting uh, one particular uh, gentleman's uh, uh, story of uh, his vehicle and how he went about fixing it. But you can see this is a great example of what one of these uh, cylinder failures looks like. So going backwards a little bit, with a hyper-eutectic engine block that normal operation, that they wear, there's normal wear, it's called ultra-mild wear, so UMW regime. So basically what happens when that piston is traveling up and down the cylinder bore, you have your combustion byproducts in the oil, you have the, the oil itself with the additives in there, and what happens is the ZBDP, and if you have any molly, um, those items and any wear metals, like from the pistons, any iron in the oil, will get embedded in the soft aluminum. And that'll actually toughen that surface as the engine is run. And then um, molly, and we'll talk about molly later, that's one of the most important additives uh, for use in oil for any engine with an all-aluminum engine block like Alucil or Locasil for wear. But this normal wear regime, you build up just like ZDDP on a camshaft lobe or on a lifter where it builds a, a, a tribofilm with those wear anti-wear additives, the same thing occurs with the aluminum cylinder bore. Um, if you have a breakdown of that tribofilm or the piston skirt coating or any, or any combination of those things, that's when you start having problems with uh, an all-aluminum engine. So one of the things that's required, like I said, you have to be able to build that tribofilm. So in this close-up, you can see the silicon particles themselves have become fractured. And basically, in normal operation, some of the particles, the, the the little peak. So imagine like Devil's Tower. You have a big flat surface uh, and that's raised up and you have oil all the way around it. So what happens is that these particles fracture and they fold into the aluminum and then basically they're not raised anymore. Um, and, base, and at that point there's a larger gap between the next particle that's exposed and the oil film itself, it can't form that tribofilm. There isn't actual a, a a gap between the top of those peaks of the silicon particle and the valley, which is the uh, raw aluminum surface. So that ability to build a, that oil film then accelerates the wear rate. Um, and then once you reach a rate of destruction of these exposed particles over 30%, that's when you start seeing more wear and it becomes a slippery slope. So really the, the, the breaking point is about 40% of those silicon particles. And uh, one of the issues you have with reconditioning an aluminum engine block is 
there's no real easy way. You're not gonna go there and uh, with a piece of paper, with a microscope, a handheld one even, and start counting damaged silicon particles. There's, there's, it's, it's just not, uh, there isn't enough time in the day uh, to do that uh, effectively with a block. So there's, we'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, there's certain ways that you can rebuild these engines to uh, do it properly. We're putting a steel sleeve isn't necessarily the best option for these engines uh, compared to uh, other engines that were designed, even if they were aluminum, to have a steel sleeve in them. So one of the things that we see, um, this is a picture of an oil filter from uh, a Porsche engine. Um, and you can see in that filter, there's actually sections of the piston skirt coating uh, that have actually come off. And they're easily identifiable because the, the Mala forged pistons have kind of like a, a, a ribbed uh, texture on the side of them. And you can see, especially in the lower circled one, you can actually see the lines uh, of that ribbing uh, where, that pist where that coating piece came off of. Um, the pistons that are plated rather than coated, we don't see this issue. We don't see the plating coming off. It wears nor we really don't even see wear on the pistons uh, at all, uh, even in high mileage cars. It seems to be more the engines that have the coated skirts, uh, that that coating, that there's an adhesion issue or a breakdown of that coating that then contributes to an aluminum to aluminum contact on the cylinder bore, which then starts that slippery slope of uh, bore scoring and that and related failure. So um, as I discussed, um, Locasil, Aliasil, and there's other um, variants of a hyperutectic engine block from other um, applications. But um, as far as the Porsches are concerned, uh, pretty much all the modern uh, Porsches use either a Locasil, Aliasil block, except for the newest, newest ones that use Sumabore uh, coating on that Aliasil block. Um, and there are a few models uh, in that lineup that have cast iron blocks like the VW VR6 engine that Porsche used for a few years in the Cayenne and the Panamera. Um, and uh, in the Macan, they use a VW uh, Tupin OT uh, engine, which is also a cast iron block. Um, another issue we see with, uh, with these aluminum blocks is that uh, there's inherent stresses in the casting. Um, and this is a, this was out of an, uh, an Alucil block from an 09 and later uh, Porsche sports car. And what we've noticed on those is that the towards the main saddles, the bores are actually moving and the, the clearances are actually tightening up uh, because the bore is getting smaller. The top might get bigger, but the bottom gets smaller. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, in this particular uh, family, family of engine, the piston the cylinder clearance is only seven to eight tenths of a thousand. So if you get uh, that much distortion in the bore, it's very easy for the pistons to actually seize. And we see both bore scoring, where it's actually a failure of the, of the silicon particles or the piston skirt coating, or we see seizing in those engines where there just is, is insufficient clearance for that forged piston once the block has started shifting. Um, and some of the symptoms, and this would apply to other makes, that when you uh, when these engines start making extra noise, and typically it sounds like a bad lifter, um, or you have uh, sooty tailpipes, and in a real bad case, you actually can see the oil, uh, like there'll be like an oil film on the back bumper. But usually it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, if you do use oil analysis, which I'll talk about, you can see the progression over time. And likewise, oil consumption. Usually these engines with the Locasil or Alucil engine blocks in normal operation use absolutely no oil. They'll, they could go uh, 5,000, 10,000 miles uh, and not burn a drop of oil and then suddenly uh, in a real in a real bad case, it can progress in over a span of three five thousand miles to burning a quart in fifty miles. Um, so it's not something that happens overnight, but you'll see a, a change, and that's why keeping track of oil consumption and looking at used oil analysis uh, gives you great insight into understanding uh, hyperuretic engine blocks and engines uh, that utilize them. 
So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, oil consumption, uh, sooty tailpipes, oily back bumper, uh, lifter noise, uh, cylinder misfires are usually, at least in the Porsche engines, when this happens, we'll see, we'll see misfires. Um, and I mentioned noisy lifters. Uh, for many years, uh, shops would just assume that they, and a car comes in and they hit, hear a tick and they think, oh, it's got a bad lifter. They'll go in, replace all the lifters, put it back together, it still has the same noise. And what you're actually hearing um, is a uh, piston slap because as the bores wear um, and then you get the scoring, one, you get the extra metal transfer and, and then you get, you get loss of ring seal and that's what contributes to the oil consumption. But as it wears, the piston, the cylinder clearance will increase. And if it gets really bad, uh, you'll get an engine, a car come in and it sounds like a diesel um, that has so much piston slap. And again, here's an example. Um, you can see a normal tailpipe, what it should look like in one of these, one of the Porsche engines, uh, Porsche vehicles. And then on the right, you can see a car with cylinder bore scoring. That tailpipe is completely sooty. And then you can actually see that oil on the rear uh, bumper cover. And another thing, when you have an engine, and this goes with for any engine. So when you have high oil consumption and you have loss of ring seal, you're going to get combustion byproducts. And one of the things that we see is a lot of soot in the oil. And you can see a healthy engine on the left, uh, and then you can see an engine that has cylinder bore scoring uh, on the right. And you can see all that soot. Um, the soot itself will lead to uh, it can lead to a timing chain failure because it's well known that increased soot levels in oil cause timing chain stretch, and we do see uh, uh, these engines have timing chain failures as as a result of uh, excess soot in the oil from cylinder bore scoring. So like I mentioned, used oil analysis, really important. Uh, you can learn a lot. Um, one test alone won't necessarily give you a whole lot of information other than to verify, yes, you have a problem. But if you have trend data for a, for a, for a car and its engine, you, and when you see a change, then you know there's a problem, uh, and then you can maybe address it. So what we're looking for in a hyper-eutectic engine, um, increase in silicon particles. Uh, because normally, at least for, uh, for an engine with a Locusil or Aducil block, the silicon content uh, should maybe be uh, in a low single digit. And um, the other thing, aluminum should be low single digit, uh, maybe one, two part per million tops. Iron in these engines usually um, is very low. Uh, we tend to see that number uh, you know, around high single digits to low teens, uh, and that's in a, say, 5,000 mile oil change interval. Uh, what I can point out here is that look at the, these silicon and aluminum levels and even the iron levels. Uh, on their own, they don't look all that bad, but if you look at the number of miles, that's in 272 miles. And obviously, the, this car had this issue previously. You can see the previous samples uh, had Mobile One in it previously, where the, where the last test had driven uh, DT40 in it. Um, the previous test, the engine already had a problem. Uh, customer was just unaware of it at that time. Uh, one of the tools that we use uh, that's critical in identifying problems with these cars with aluminum engine blocks is a bore scope. Um, at, in, in most applications, uh, it's the easiest thing to do is to pull the spark plug and look at it uh, through there. Uh, the biggest issue that we have doing that is that the problem always starts at BDC and it works its way up from the bottom of the cylinder. So we've developed processes, at least with uh, the Porsche engines with Locusil blocks, where we, uh, we advise uh, shops to drop the sump uh, and then fish in a bore scope uh, from the sump area with the piston at TDC so you can actually look at the bottom of the cylinder bore uh, and see if there's any wear starting there because it, well, at least in the engines with uh, Locusil blocks that's where the wear always starts is at BDC. So 
Some of the contributing factors, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the actual manufacturing processes have changed and maybe that's causing an issue. Um, another thing that we've, uh, we've noticed that we've been seeing fuel injectors go bad, having poor fuel spray or uh, leaking. And we've had instances where customers have uh, replaced an engine that had a, a, a lock of sill engine block, so a Boxster came in 911, uh, and they bought a replacement engine, a long block or a short block from Porsche, and then uh, transferred all the ancillaries onto the engine, and that would have included the fuel injectors. And then within two, 3,000 miles, have a cylinder failure again in the same cylinder that had a failure in the prior engine. And we found this several times where if there's been a bad injector. Um, poor fuel atomization, uh, so bad fuel spray or uh, the injector leaking ends up washing the cylinder board down. And as uh, I alluded to, lubrication, that proper tribofilm, tribo is absolutely critical to making this whole system work. So we've actually gone as far as to, uh, on engines where we've uh, reconditioned the block, uh, we tell uh, shops install using that block to build an engine, hey, you need to replace the injectors. Just sending them out for testing alone won't necessarily um, prevent this from happening because in this case, these lift this actual test that I have on screen, those lifters are necessary. Those lifters, the injectors have actually tested good 3,000 miles prior. And then after those failures a second time, then they sh came up that the injectors were bad um, the second time. So um, like I discussed, like we showed that picture of the oil filter and there was a chunk of the coating off the piston. So here's an example of a uh, 997 uh, Porsche 911 uh, 3.8 engine. Engine was pulled apart. It actually had had an intermediate shaft bearing failure, not a cylinder failure. Uh, but you can see when we pulled it apart that the piston skirt coating was already uh, delaminating off the piston. So had it not had uh, a intermediate shaft failure, it would have likely suffered a cylinder failure um, a few, and within a few thousand miles. Um, and again, looking at the, um, we put our profilometer through the bore, which isn't the most accurate way for of measuring um, the condition of the uh, hyperutectic uh, surface of the cylinder bores, but Colvin Schmidt does put out um, numbers for roughness average, RPK, RK, and RVK. And we ran our profilometer through the, uh, uh, through the bores. And uh, you can see here, you see RT is in, is in ring travel, UT is under ring travel. Um, so you can see areas in the cylinders where um, there's either it's getting close to being out of spec or that it's out of spec. And this particular engine would have passed a visual inspection. So the bores had no scratches in them, no sign of wear whatsoever, but you can see that the surface was already um, beyond uh, the wear tolerances for surface finish and would have had a failure. And we run into this to a lot of shops that pull these engines apart and don't have uh, the proper tools or the or know the uh, methodology behind how you uh, qualify the block as being reusable and they'll just throw new rings on the pistons and put it back together and the engine will fail six months nine months later of, uh, of cylinder bore scoring because they because the bores look good and they just ran with it um, another issue that we see I discussed uh, uh, the cylinder bores moving um, with the lock of sill engine blocks, um, we see that the cylinder bores actually oval quite a bit and you get quite a bit of taper. Um, the wear limit, um, Porsche is really bad about sharing uh, specifications for their current generation of vehicles. So anything pretty much uh, after 2000 and later, there, there just aren't many specs. Um, but I was able to uh, dig up the, on the right you can see that they have a wear limit um, of three and two tenths uh, thousandths. And we know that these blocks, when they're brand new, they're honed absolutely round in free air. So the, the, they don't have a torque plate on, they don't torque plate hone them or anything. So the bores are perfectly round. 
So all these ovality and uh, paper numbers that you can see up there, there's six thou of ovality, almost five thou of ovality, five, four, all these numbers that these, this block is out of spec. And again, like I said, this block may look perfect, but if you didn't actually measure it and check it, um, you, would, you would not know that those cylinders are out of spec and that something needs to be done before you can actually rebuild the engine with that block. So one of the issues that, like I said, fuel um, dilution um, is a big problem, um, overfueling or, or wash down of the cylinder bores because lubrication is, is paramount to keeping these engines alive. So um, properly warming up the engine also plays a, a plays into this. Um, a lot of people uh, have remote start on their cars now. They'll just remote start it, let it idle, and, and let until the interior is warmed up, or um, or they'll go out on the weekend, start their car, just let it idle before they go off just because they think they're doing something good for the engine. Um, having engines run in extended cold start with uh, hyper eutectic engine blocks is just bad for the for the cylinder walls because you have the, the fuel fuel is not a lubricant uh, so starting the car and then waiting 10 15 seconds and then just start driving um, and then making sure not to go wide open not to make sure that you have excesses R, excesses rpm because you need the engine to first warm up evenly and and gently you don't want to just start it up and just go wide open um, because you need to give time for everything to expand and get the operating temperature. Um, and ob obviously, if you do that, that helps a whole lot. But the idling is the biggest issue. And um, we see more issues with engines with hypertechnic engine blocks from colder climates. So, And we know that those vehicles are seeing a lot more time in cold start um, and longer time in cold start. Um, Going back to lubrication, um, as you can see that with um, the piston cylinder system, cylinder bore, that it's running in a mixed lubricate, like mixed film lubrication scenario. Uh, but those silicon particles are key to making the, a hyper eutectic engine block work. Without those exposed silicon particles, as you can see on the right, you have nowhere for uh, there's no separation between the silicon particles and the aluminum for that oil to sit. Like, like an, the analogy of Devil's Tower, uh, elevated up and then all the oil goes around it. That, that's absolutely critical. And that's also why what oil is used is so critical. And then how often you change that oil. Because the oil is the one thing that is keeping this whole system alive. So... I, I touched on earlier Molly. Um, Molly, unlike ZDDP, can bond to aluminum. And it doesn't require pressure, temperature. Uh, ZDP needs pr uh, pressure to actually adhere. You have that pressure and that movement of, let's say, a, a follower or a rocker on a camshaft lobe. Uh, that creates pressure. And that pressure with the ZDDP present in the oil will build that uh, anti-wear film on the part. Uh, with Molly, um, you don't need the temperature and the pressure uh, just as, as much. Um, and the Molly can attach to aluminum. And the way that Molly works is that it builds sheets of itself. They can attach to itself. And once it builds up that Molly film, what wears is a layer of the Molly. So it'll slough a layer off. And the best way to explain it, I call it glassy plate. And then you have one plate of glass slides off, but you have another one underneath it. Um, and again, the oil, again, is so critical because you, if you have an oil that is, has high detergency, um, that the dis detergents in the oil are fighting that anti-wear film and are cleaning those mo the molly films and the ZDDP films off parts. So oil chemistry is very critical. Um, and I, I mentioned A40, just if, if you're looking at this, that's one of the Porsche standards for oils. And the A40 oil has very little molly in it. So one of the things that we advise owners of uh, vehicles uh, with 
hypertrophic engine blocks is that you want to have an oil that has a good amount of moly in it. Um, so um, just to give two examples, there's other oils. Um, I'm partial to uh, the driven products, uh, the DT40, that our company helped uh, with the development of that oil, uh, specifically for uh, Porsche applications and for uh, sports cars. It has a very healthy uh, dose of Molly. That's a minimum at 300. Um, there are additives available out there. I'm not a huge fan of additives, but one that we know works and a lot of Porsche people and a lot of Porsche shops use is Liqui Molly's Zeratec. Um, we would just recommend if you're going to run any additive, you want to use an oil from that manufacturer uh, just to minimize the likelihood of having additive clash um, because you just don't know how that additive is going to work with another brand of oil. At least you know if you're using a liquid moly additive with a liquid moly oil that you're good to go. Another thing that uh, uh, we've advised uh, customers, um, if an engine, if you bore scope it and it's just starting to wear, um, going with a slightly thicker viscosity, even though you're gonna lose some fuel economy, say five, 10% fuel economy, that oil film is going to be thicker and stronger. Um, and the, what we use uh, in the Porsche engines uh, is the FR50, which was originally made for Coyote, but it's formulated identically to the DT40. It's just a higher viscosity. And it has the Molly in there as well to help uh, protect those cylinder bores. Um, another big thing that contributes this, we know the ethanol fuels um, are wreak havoc on uh, on our vehicles. Um, we can't always get ethanol free. For most of us, we're stuck using uh, an E10 fuel. Um, using a top tier fuel is an absolute must. Um, if you don't use a top tier fuel, then you need to resort to using some sort of fuel additive regularly to clean the injectors. Um, and in some cases, we even recommend using additives to address the uh, corrosive uh, and corrosive issues uh, of ethanol fuels in our fuel systems, especially on cars that were never designed to run ethanol fuels. Um, what we use um, are the driven. Uh, we use the injector defender or the defender booster, if, like if it's a modern car with, with force induction with knock sensing and can tell that you have higher octane in there, we use that. Um, for cars that are going to be sitting for a long time, uh, storage defender, uh, it's more than just uh, stabilizing the fuel. It's all the additives in there also address the uh, corrosive uh, corrosion issues associated with ethanol fuels. Again, especially in vehicles never designed to run uh, ethanol fuels. Um, what, and the main ingredient as far as keeping the fuel system clean that's critical to use is a PEA, so polyether amine. Um, some other additives that have that, like if you got Chevron Tecron, but you have to, it's the more expensive one that has, that says uh, complete fuel system uh, cleaner or treatment or some, some wording like that. And usually products that have PEA in them will actually state it on the label. Uh, because again, from a marketing standpoint, that's a superior additive for keeping the fuel system clean. So if they're using it, they're going to want to let you know. So um, what we do um, to address the issue, um, we, we do have to sleeve engine blocks. Uh, we use aluminum sleeves rather than steel sleeves, and we use um, a nickel silicon carbide plating. Uh, it's called NSC. It's basically like Nicosil, which was developed by Mala many decades ago. Um, and then you, it's a matrix of nickel silicon and carbide that's electroplated onto the cylinder bore. Um, and that it's a very hard surface. It also is oilophilic, so it, it holds oil, attracts oil, um, and then it's diamond honed. So it, it doesn't look like a cast iron block when you hone it. Sometimes it even almost looks, it's close to mirror finish. Sometimes it's very hard to see crosshatch, but there is crosshatch there. Uh, typical uh, surface finish, um, I know that RA isn't the be all end all, but usually the surface finish on a bore um, is from a race engine, it could be as low as four. On a street engine, it could be, it's usually somewhere between seven to 10 uh, properly honed 
with a um, uh, nicotyl surface that's been diamond honed, and again, it's plateau honed because it, it is very hard, and if um, it doesn't wear, it doesn't wear in like a cast iron bore. Uh, the rings will actually wear to the cylinder walls, uh, but it's not uncommon. You pull an engine with nicotyl bores apart if you've never used one. That uh, in most cases you can just deglaze the bores if it's intolerant and just put new rings on it and go because the, the surface is so hard and, and that uh, is very low wear. And the other benefit of it is that it's very low friction. So usually you get a gain in horsepower, fuel economy, etc. Um, the biggest issue with the process is cost. Manufacturers, uh, Porsche included, Ford, the, there's various technologies out there to uh, advance the uh, aluminum engine block, uh, but to retain the benefits of the thermal efficiency and the volumetric uh, efficiency without having to put a steel sleeve. So you have PTWA, RSW, uh, APS, which uh, Sumabor is an APS coating. Um, uh, we use, we have used the APS, the Sumabor process uh, internally for development work to, uh, to test the process out and see how it works. And it works very well. Um, when, once you have a block that's been coated and honed, it's, it's very thin. Uh, just like Nicosil, you end up with a coating on the bore that is approximately 4,000 thick. So that allows for heat transfer uh, through that coating to the aluminum cylinder and to the water jacket. And that again, that allows for the uh, increased power, uh, smaller cooling systems, just in general more efficient. Um, and the, these particular um, uh, processes, whether it's a PTWA, RSW, or the uh, APS to bore coating, um, they, they can alloy um, the materials that are being applied to the bore, like uh, Orlicon, who developed the sumo bore process, has um, many different uh, compositions of coatings that can be applied to the bore with different properties, uh, depending on the application. Um, sumo bore, Porsche, like I mentioned, Porsche uses it, VW uses it. Lots of automakers are using it. And this this uh, doc, this doc um, list is obviously a few years old. I'm sure there's more companies uh, using uh, their process now. But you can see that it is uh, uh, a very uh, popular process. And we know that it works. Uh, right now, as far as for the aftermarket, it's not quite accessible. Uh, they do have um, a, a service center uh, in New York. And they also have one in France that can do uh, they do mostly prototyping for the OEMs there. They're not set up for serial production. They'll happily coat you a, uh, your bores for you. Uh, you have to do all the prep work and then you have to do all the honing yourself. Um, they, that technology can be used to repair an aluminum engine block, just like Nicosil. Uh, just the cost ends up be, being approximately four times as much as doing Nicosil. So at, the, at this time, it's not quite uh, approachable uh, for anything other than a very exotic uh, rare application. Um, if you want to learn more about um, a hyper eutectic engine block and a deep dive if you're really technical, I wrote a white paper on this subject uh, a few years back. Um, you can download it if you just go to uh, bit.ly slash cylinder bore scoring or you can use the QR code and that'll take you to the same URL if that's easier for you. You can download that uh, from our website to read. Um, and that goes, like I said, that's a deep dive into the nitty gritty of the technology, the development, and uh, some of the problems and some of the solutions that we've, uh, we've come up with for the, the hypertechnic engine blocks. And uh, that's all I have. We can go uh, on to the questions at this point. Excellent, Charles. Um, excellent presentation. Some really good information there. And I know, uh, especially on the tech line, we're receiving more and more calls about these types of, of cylinders and how to prep them and how to do them. Um, I really got a kick actually out of you mentioning, you said uh, like Porsche to find decent specs after the year 2000. We, we fight the same thing on the tech line. We, we, a lot of times we can't find much in any kind of bottom end information um, for a lot of the German manufacturers after 2000. So, you know, folks are struggling for main housing bore sizes and that kind of stuff. And 
we explained to them that's just not published. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because it kind of it kind of backs up that we're not the only ones having this issue. So um, specs are hard to find. Um, okay, so a couple questions here for you. Um, are the rings different or specific when used with these plated cylinders? In my experience looking at them, they're typically like a, a CRN uh, coated uh, top ring with a uh, ductile or cast second, and usually the um, the oil controls will be a uh, uh, I, again, like a CRN uh, coated uh, or a uh, um, stainless or a nitrided steel. So it's it's nothing it's nothing special as far as the rings are concerned um, w that are run with the cylinder bores, at least with the Porsche engines with the Locatil or the ISL uh, cylinder bores. Okay, all right. Um, another question for you is. Uh, we see lots of Nicosil motorcycle cylinders. We are not set up for diamond honing. Can you suggest the best way to deglaze these for like a re-ring situation? Um, what we have just recently, so for many years, what we've always advised customers is to uh, wash the cylinders, hot soapy water, use a red scotch bright pad, scuff the cylinder because that's uh, that aluminum oxide pad if you put enough uh, uh, muscle behind it, it's not going to hurt the Nicosil, but it'll clean the valleys out really well. Um, then typically we'll throw them into ultrasonic, um, pass them through there, and then the last final uh, process that we do would be to clean the bores with denatured alcohol using a Kim wipe. And basically you keep wiping the bores down until the, the white Kim wipe comes out as white as it went in. And you'd be surprised how dirty the bores are, um, even after the first two steps, even after an ultrasonic, how much you still get out of the, the crosshatch. Um, BRM, so Brush Research Manufacturing, does make a, uh, a grape hone, grape ball hone, uh, that's specifically designed for uh, deglazing Nicosil. Um, we have tried it as of late. Uh, I had actually never tried, tried them before. Um, and I actually tried it on a set of cylinders out of an engine that I had, and it actually brought the cylinder finish absolutely almost right back to what it was when it was brand new because we had records of what it was before running and after. So it, it seems to be an effective uh, pro uh, option as well. Okay, super. Um, actually, this question is all the way from Egypt. One of our attendees has got a question for you. Um, he's asked, uh, some people put cast iron sleeves in hypertectic aluminum blocks and it works. What are the good and the bads of this? And I know you covered a little bit of that in your presentation. So at least with, I can give you direct uh, experience with uh, the Porsche engines. What we see when uh, steel sleeves are put into those engines, uh, the blocks tend to crack um, if you put enough interference that the sleeve doesn't move. Um, but in most cases, what we're seeing is the blocks, and they must just grow enough that a lot of the engines that have had steel sleeves put in, um, that the sleeves are moving, and they're either rotating or they're dropping. It depends whether it's a, a wet sleeve or a dry sleeve. But um, like since the beginning of the year, just to give an example, about a quarter of all the engine blocks that we see, and we probably see about uh, four to five blocks a week. Um, about a quarter of them have had steel sleeves fitted and have uh, had subsequent uh, failures. And I, don't, and I don't know if that's uh, specific to the Porsche application uh, or something that's specific to a hyperutectic uh, engine, but I know with a lot of the European manufacturers, and maybe this is a contributing factor, um, that they've really pared down how much material they have to put into the castings. They're trying to make the castings as light as possible with the minimum uh, wall thicknesses, uh, again, for weight reduction and fuel economy. And uh, it, it, I, I just, I honestly believe that maybe the, this uh, push towards ultimate efficiency to have it be uh, almost on the bleeding edge, that there's no room for overbores on them because at that point because we've we've tried with some of the engines to overbore them 
and then uh, put Nicosil on them, or in some cases just put Nicosil on them without putting an aluminum sleeve in, and you can still have cylinder failures where the cylinders crack um, in the, or the block cracks uh, without uh, a replacement sleeve having been installed, um, or if you overbore the block beyond the stock size, that it's enough to uh, to make it that it it's possible for it to crack. Okay, all right. Um, Charles, we've got a couple in here. They've asked, what's the best way to get a hold of you? And I would say probably that information on the on your last slide that you've got up on the screen now is that is that the best. Um, best yes. way to, to contact yeah, uh, you. Yeah, let me make that. I'll I'll make that a little bit bigger. That easier to see. Excellent. There. Now yeah, that's a little bit easier for everyone. Perfect. To see. But yeah, that's the that's, yeah. the that's the best way to get a hold of us. Okay. All right. Uh, another question, Charles. Can Nicosil be applied to, to the piston skirt instead of aluminum cylinder bore? If so, would it reduce the cost? I don't know of anybody that does that, but it, yes, it has been done. If, again, if you uh, download the white paper uh, that I have on the topic, and I'll go back up the slide. If you download that white paper, I do discuss that in there, and I off the top of my head, I can't remember if it was Honda or if it was Toyota, but they did uh, Nicosil the uh, the piston skirts, um, and when they were in the development, that was one of the things they did try and did work. Um, but I just don't know anyone because part of the obviously when you Nicosil something, the surface when it attaches, you end up with a very rough surface. Uh, it's like sandpaper. I mean, it's it's very rough. You have to go in there and hone it. Um, you would have to have some kind of process after you coat the piston, the piston skirt to actually provide a surface finish that would actually uh, um, not end up being a big piece of sandpaper running up and down the cylinder bore. Okay, all right. Um, this one's kind of model specific. So they're asking, did Volkswagen use uh, this in their two liter TSI engine family because they've said here that we have all the symptoms discussed that you mentioned today. Uh, the two liter TSI out of a Golf 6 GTI, for example. Are you aware of that having a. I am not aware of uh, whether they used an. I, I was under the impression, and I may, I'm not a Volkswagen expert, I thought all the 2.0 uh, turbo engines were all cast iron blocks. I'll go back a slide. Um, Volkswagen, um, so Volkswagen Group. I know there's a there's a, a like a one point. I don't know if it's I, I, again. I don't. Yeah, it says right here the the one liter TSI engine, uh, Polo and Golf um, that that uses sumo bore. So it's quite possible maybe in some other markets um, there were there's a, a Volkswagen engine that maybe was an aluminum block. But as far as I, I am aware of, uh, at least in the North American market, I was I thought that all the 2.0 T engines were just cast iron blocks. Okay, excellent. Um, Charles, this gentleman's asked, where can a machinist go to get hands-on training for reconditioning alusil cylinders? That's what, honestly, um, the the safest way to do this because here's. You could talk to Sunnen or you could talk to Rottler. Uh, they can sell you, uh, you can, you'd be able to overbore the block, uh, maybe do a half millimeter over. Uh, that typically will clean up uh, deep gouging from, from a scoring failure. Then you can get uh, from them uh, the proper honing uh, equipment. Like Sunnen has their like felt pads that go onto the, uh, the honing head and then you use that um, etching paste and you do that process uh, to expose the silicon particles um, and then once you do that you'd have to go to um, Mala Motorsport uh, as, as, as I'm as far as I know they're the only ones that can make you a piston aftermarket that has uh, that can have the proper skirt coating that will hold up with a hyperutectic engine bore um, the trouble with this is there aren't many people 
I don't even know of anybody that uh, in the Porsche world that will recondition an Alucil uh, uh, engine block uh, that way. Uh, what most people do is um, send the block out for uh, nicotyl plating. Um, what you end up doing there is uh, you have to overbore the cylinder roughly uh, about eight to ten thousandths. You have to overbore it, then it can be uh, direct plated with nicosyl honed, and then you can use an aftermarket piston in that case. And that's uh, like going to JE, for example. You can just put an aftermarket forged piston in the engine, and uh, with nicosyl compatible rings, um, you obviously need to set the clearance properly. Um, but that that option does work uh, doing direct plating as long as there's no other inherent uh, issues with the engine block. Um, the only other factor in there is if the um, cylinder bore is deeply gouged, you would have to, again, take it a little bit over, like half millimeter over, then to be able to direct plate it. Uh, and one of the considerations, you have to make sure that nicosyl compatible rings are available. Um, and if you call someone like Total Seal and you tell them what you're doing, that it's nicosyl, they will they will supply you uh, rings. Like I just uh, ordered a set of pistons this morning for a uh, uh, 944 uh, engine, a three liter, and uh, we overboard the block half millimeter, and we're having uh, nicosyl plated, and I was able to get a half millimeter over set of rings from Total Seal that are nicosyl compatible. Um, and just so that everyone understands what nicosyl compatible means, part of it is tension. Uh, Nicosil requires low tension piston rings. Then the second thing is you can't use hard chrome rings on Nicosil because uh, the hardness is too close of hard chrome with Nicosil. And as you, as many know, that if you can't have two materials, uh, similar materials, similar hardnesses rubbing against each other, that causes issues. So typically you have to use a softer uh, ring material and Porsche used uh, for many years um, caster ductile rings in the compression position and the second ring and also used a cast um, two-piece oil control. Uh, but if you can talk to Total Steel, there's lots of rings available now uh, for Nicosil in lots of bore sizes. Where when I started doing this uh, 22 years ago, 23 years ago, there, there weren't a whole lot of options. Uh, for nicosyl compatible rings. So we had to use a lot of OE stuff that, uh, and then build pistons around OE rings. Okay, all right. Um, you kind of touched base this too a little bit in the presentation I saw, but referring to the Honda FRM technology, how different is it from Alucil technology and how does this relate to necessary piston coating? It's, it's it's different. It's the process itself is about the, the actual metallurgy. It's still a hyperutectic engine block with silicon particles. Just the way they get there is slightly different than what uh, Coleman Schmidt did for Porsche and for GM or anyone else who has used Alucil or Lacosil. Um, but again, it's it's critical with with those FRM blocks that um, you still have to have a piston that has some sort of uh, appropriate coating, whether it's an ironclad coating or some other coating. Uh, that has been proven to hold up against that uh, hyperutectic uh, engine block. Okay, super. Um, again, a little bit model specific for the Porsche. They're asking what type of coating was used on a 1986 944 block? On, I'm not a huge 944 person. I'm assuming this is, an, if it's a 944, it's going to have an Alucil block. Uh, the piston will have, um, Typically, if I remember correctly, that was a Mala piston in there, and it had a ferro stand, so it was like an iron-clad uh, plating that was put onto the piston. Um, and like I mentioned, that the plated coatings that they put, or the plating when they put the iron-clad coatings on the Coleman Schmidt cast or the Mala cast or Mala forge pistons back from the 70s, 80s, uh, and uh, 90s. Um, that that holds up really well, but it would seem that uh, there's it's it's an industry wide uh, push to get plating operations uh, get rid of them because of environmental uh, concerns, 
and the OEMs obviously going away from having to plate pistons and going to a, uh, a printed wear pad, uh, applied pad onto the piston from it, that, that likely was probably done from an environmental reason and probably a cost reason as well. Okay, all right. And um, one last question here for you, Charles, and then just to respect everybody's day, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you get on with your day. And um, this gentleman is asking, are you related at all to the Navarro of the California hot rodding uh, in the late 40s and 50s? They're wondering if you were no, related. I, no, I am not, but I'm very uh, well versed. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up uh, in uh, Laverne, San Dimas, and there was a little speed shop in the downtown uh, San Dimas, and I remember going in there and seeing uh, uh, Navarro cast into uh, hot rod parts. <laughs> so, yeah, not not oh, related, not related, not related, but uh, I am very well versed uh, 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 in him. Okay, perfect. Well, Charles, we we really appreciate the time you took today. This is a great presentation. Um, you really touch base on on a topic that again is is new for a lot of our our shops. We're just starting to see this stuff now, and uh, it, it's nice to know how we can deal with it. And if we can deal with it, you've kind of covered all that. So we appreciate your time. Um, and like I say, if there's any questions that come in afterwards, we'll make sure to get those over to you, and you make sure you have a good good long weekend where you're at. Yep. Same to you, and same to everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Super. Thanks, Charles. All right, well, I'll go back over to Amanda here, and uh, and she'll just finish things up for today. All right, we'll keep this quick for you guys. Uh, first off, all our webinars can be viewed on our YouTube channel. If you haven't yet, go out to YouTube and search Engine Builders Association, find our page, and make sure to hit that subscribe button. Um, you can view all our past webinars on there, as well as any future ones. And this one should be up, I'm guessing, with a holiday weekend, probably early next week. And then lastly, there will be a survey that pops up when you leave today. Please take a moment, fill that out, let us know how we're doing. And um, there's a spot in there to ask any additional questions you may have as well. So if we get any questions in there, we will pass them along and get them answered for you. And thank you for attending. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to attend our webinars, it means a lot. If you need to contact anyone at AERA, you can reach us at 815-526-7600. And you'll also see my email as well as Rob's is there. You can shoot us an email and we are happy to do what we can to help. So thank you everyone and we hope you have a great rest of your day.